a super amazing treat tonight, but I don't want to take any more of his time. So would you help me in welcoming Dr. Yes. Alan Tennyson? Woo! Woo! Amazing. I'll get off so you can jump and go for it. Logan's just afraid I'm going to hug him. Uh, it is wonderful to be here. Uh, this is such a good end to a really tough day. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we have a five-year-old, but we also do respite care. Uh, where we'll take in children uh, from time to time to be able to keep them out of the foster system uh, while their parents are getting whatever help they need. So this week, uh, we got a call uh, to take in a newborn from the hospital. Uh, Mom is incarcerated, and so they said, would you take the newborn? We said, sure. Uh, so the newborn came to our house this week, and that night my wife looks at me. I run out because we're low on toilet paper. Still haven't found any. So I'm talking to my wife. She's like, I'm starting to feel sick. And I'm like, oh, no, you cannot get sick right now. We have a newborn. I've got a five-year-old. We can't get sick right now. Then she said, okay, I'll try. Woke up in the morning vomiting and hasn't stopped for two days. So, thankfully, I found a babysitter for tonight. I'll be rushing home right after this so that I can be there, but the kids are taken care of. But I had to go to a pediatrician visit alone as a dad with this newborn. It was their pediatrician visit, their first one. So I show up with the baby, and the lady checking me in looks at me, looks at the baby, and then says, is your wife joining you? And I'm like, no, 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 she, she's sick. Okay, I go to the next person for the insurance. She looks at me, looks at the baby, and then says, are you sure no one's joining you? No, no one's joining me. So then the nurse calls us back. She looks at me, looks at the baby. What do you think she says? Is it just you? I am a college dean. I can take care of a baby, right? So that was my day, right? And it was hard. That was my day. So it is so good to be here tonight with you all. I love young adult ministry. I've spent most of my life in young adult ministry. Uh, before becoming a college professor, I was a pastor in Los Angeles for about 15 years. About half that was as a young adult pastor. Uh, I loved doing that ministry. I loved being there. It was one of the things I loved most about California. Uh, other than that, uh, there were some things I didn't like about California. Because uh, I didn't grow up there. I'm from rural Kentucky. And rural Kentucky and Los Angeles are two very different places. And one of the things I didn't like about L.A. when I was there was how many times people in L.A. would be disparaging for about where I'm from. Uh, in fact, there was a phrase in Los Angeles I actually grew to hate. And the phrase was this. It was flyover state. You know, you'd say something like this. You know, I, I was on my way from L.A. to New York, but the plane had to stop in one of those flyover states. What is a flyover state? It's one of those states in the middle that no one wants to go to because there's no culture there. That's the idea. You have to spend a night in Kentucky. Oh, no, you are in a flyover state. And I, I don't like that phrase because it's disparaging to where I'm from. But I actually think there's something about that phrase that is useful for us, something I want to talk about tonight. Because I think sometimes we have the same idea when it comes to certain passages of the Bible. How many know there are certain passages of the Bible that are flyover passages? I've never read the Bible and you come to this point and you're like, whoops, there we go. You know, it was great in Exodus, goodbye Leviticus. Now we're going straight to three stories in Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Joshua, here we come. Right, we jump over. It is a flyover passage. Tonight, I want to read for you what may be the most flown over passage in the Bible. And what's awkward about it is it's the first chapter of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse number 1. And I'm just going to read here the first six verses. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. And Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers... And Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of the David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now what's so awkward about this is that this is how the New Testament begins. 
How many of you ever had someone come to faith in your church, come to faith in your group, and they're like, I'm so excited to read the Bible, I'm going to start with the Gospel of Matthew. And you're like, no! Start with Mark. Start with John. Don't start with Matthew. We don't want to lose you in the first six verses. There's an awkwardness to this. I want to point out something that I think is really powerful about these first verses of Matthew. Now, one, genealogies are important, of course, in the Old Testament, because genealogies are all about family. They tell us where we came from and give us an idea of where we can go. But all genealogies in the Bible are really genealogies about fathers and sons, right? It's one of those awkward things because of how they counted back then that the person doing all the work doesn't even get mentioned. He was the father of him, he was the father of him, he was the father of him, he was the father of him. When you're reading Matthew 1 from that ancient world perspective, what really stands out to you is all of the women who actually get mentioned in the genealogy. And what's so cool about the women who are mentioned in these first six verses is they are all misbehaving women. And that's one of the reasons why they're in the first six verses. You start with the first one, Tamar. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Tamar's first husband died. Tamar's second husband, which was her brother-in-law, died. Because again, the idea in the ancient world was, if your son dies before giving birth, you give your bro his brother to the widow, because the first child she has will now carry the name of the son that died, so he has a place in the genealogy. He doesn't disappear from the family history. But the second son dies. There's a third son left. Judah doesn't want to give that third son to Tamar, because now he sees her like a black widow. But really, it's the problem of her son, of his sons, not her. So in the story, what she does is she needs to get pregnant so that she can have a future in this family because this is the ancient world and your children are the ones who take care of you. So she goes out by the side of the road where she knows Judah will be after his wife dies. She dresses like a prostitute. She stays veiled. Judah, after mourning his wife, pays for her services. And then she just disappears. Then a short while later, they come and say to her, him, hey, your daughter-in-law is pregnant, you know, the one who you didn't give any other son to. And he says, oh, she's got to be punished. And she basically lets him know who the father is. And Judah has this brilliant line where he simply says this, she is more righteous than I am. What made her more righteous than Judah? Judah had a responsibility to fulfill the promises of God who said of Abraham that you're going to have many descendants. Tamar took that responsibility more seriously than Judah, and because of that, she actually becomes one of the grandmothers of Jesus. We get to the next woman, who actually probably was a prostitute, Rahab. Now in the Hebrew, she's called a prostitute in some translations, though actually in the Hebrew, what the word means, and you can correct me here, Luke, what the word means is someone who rents out a room for the night, but it was the word you would use for prostitutes. She's holding the two Hebrew spies in her home in the city of Jericho. And of course you think that's got to be an awkward conversation if she is a prostitute for those two Hebrew spies to explain to their families where they met her. But they're staying in her house while they're hiding out in the town of Jericho. She says to them, I believe that the God of Israel is going to take this city and I want to be on your side. And the irony here is the last time spies were sent out, they didn't trust God. And now you have a woman in the city of Jericho who's saying, I want to be on the right side of this. She is more faithful to the promises of God than the Israelites were. And she becomes a grandmother of Jesus. Then you come to the story of Ruth. There's an entire book of the Bible named for Ruth. Ruth is known entirely by her faithfulness. She's someone who is so faithful to her mother-in-law. She says that I will go where you go, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, where you die, I will be buried. In other words, till death do us part, I'm extending my wedding vows to you. She is known for her faithfulness, but what's shocking about her, because many say these are misbehaving women, the shocking thing about Ruth is that she's a Moabite. Because the story of the Moabites in the Bible is this, they are the result of of the daughters of Lot raping their father so they can get pregnant. It is a family tree that starts off crooked. And when people would talk about the Moabites, 
That's what they would think of was that incestuous relationship that starts everything. And yet Ruth, the daughter of that union, is a grandmother of Jesus. What's so crazy to me is now, when you read the story of two daughters raping their father, you're actually reading about grandmothers of Jesus. Ruth is faithful, and she brings her entire family line into the ancestry of Jesus. And then we come to the last one, which is the most unique. And it's unique for this reason. It says that David had Solomon by the wife of Uriah, or the uh, your wife of Uriah. It never actually names her. In the Bible, she's Bathsheba. But it's not naming her because it's being cruel to Bathsheba. It's that in every story, who gets named? It's the person who was the most faithful. Tamar was faithful to the promises of God. Rahab was faithful to the promises of God. Ruth was faithful to the promises of God. In the story of David and Bathsheba, the only one who's faithful is the husband Uriah the Hittite, who was so faithful he wouldn't even go along with David's plan to let people know that he didn't knock up the wife of one of his soldiers. Uriah isn't even a part of the ancestry of Jesus. He's not a grandfather here. It's all David and Bathsheba. But because Uriah was faithful, more so than the very king of Israel, Uriah's name is in the genealogy of Jesus. In Matthew 1, the people who are faithful to the promises of God are the ones who become the ancestors of Jesus. And what's so interesting to me is, of course, the genealogy stops with Jesus. But it stops with Jesus because Jesus is the one from whom all the rest of us come as spiritual descendants. He never gets married. He never has children. But through the rest of the New Testament, when it talks about our relationship to Jesus, how many of you know it talks about it using the image of family? We become adopted into that family. We are the children of God. God is our Father. Jesus is our brother. We speak of one another as brothers and sisters before God. When we read the stories of the ancestors of Jesus, they are people who are faithful to the promise of God. When we look at who we are as the descendants of Jesus, of His work, of His ministry, what defines us as part of that family is our faithfulness to the Word of God. Josiah asked me to speak, and when I asked him, what is it that he would like me to talk about, Josiah actually mentioned this. He said, you know, he said, when you're on the podcast, the thing that really stood out to me was this phrase where he basically asked me, what do I think was one of the worst things happening in the church today? And my answer was, it's the lack of biblical literacy. And my analogy that I used in the podcast was this. It's like the church is married to the Bible, and we used to live under the same roof, and we ate at the same table and we shared the same bed. But now it feels as if the church and the Bible are still married, but we're going through some period of separation where we don't eat at the same table, we don't share the same bed, we're just still having a relationship on paper. And at some point, that kind of relationship will eventually lead to divorce. And that's exactly the way other churches have gone. The Bible simply has no authority over us. What I want to talk about tonight is the importance of biblical literacy. The importance of biblical literacy. The Bible gives us the story of Jesus. And we become part of that story as it becomes our story. And this is actually what biblical formation means. It's the process by which the Bible becomes our story. And all the results that come from living out that story. What I'm really talking about is discipleship. Discipleship is where we reach the point where we learn to live as if we're living out the story of the Bible. That's the importance of biblical literacy. Jesus in the Bible is presented to us as the Word of God. And I like to put it this way. I put it up here on the screen because, in a sense, Jesus is the capital W Word of God, which means what? He's the greatest revelation of God. Anything you want to know about God has to first be filtered through Jesus because Jesus doesn't just come to us as someone who's God-like. What he shows us is that God is Christ-like. And everything the Bible says about God now is filtered through that person of Jesus. So it kind of goes like this. God, 
Jesus, the greatest revelation of God. Then you have the gospel, which is the message of Jesus. Then you have the Bible, which is the infallible record of what God has done in the world through Christ. Then you have the church, which is that which teaches and brings people into a life of the word of God. And then you have the world, which is where we're sent out as the place of salvation. Now, what seems to be missing from this whole list? What? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So where do we find the Holy Spirit in this? How is it that Jesus is conceived? By the Holy Spirit. How is it that the message of Jesus goes forth? By the Spirit. How is it that the Bible was inspired? How is it that the church teaches the Bible? How is it that the church goes out into the world? The Holy Spirit is all over this. Everything that God does in the world, He's doing through His Spirit for the glory of the Son, which goes back to the Father. What's our role in this? Our role is to be people who bring others into the life of the Bible. Our role is to be people who bring others into the life of the Bible because without that, there will always be a cap on how much someone can mature in their faith. And understand what I mean by that. I'm not talking about formal education. I'm talking about a knowledge of God's Word. Without that knowledge of God's Word, there will always be a cap on how far someone can grow in their faith. You know, people can be illiterate and still have a knowledge of God's Word. But without that knowledge, there will always be a cap. What's the Scripture say here? In 2 Timothy, probably the most famous passage we have about Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is inspired by God. Have you heard that before? How does that verse continue, though? All Scripture, one, is inspired by God. But all Scripture is also, two, and is useful. And is useful. Too many times as Christians, we focus so much on inspiration, but we forget usefulness. Mm -hmm. Useful for what? For correcting? For rebuking? For training? Up in righteousness? All Scripture is inspired. Again, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Another way of translating this is to say oh, it's God-breathed or God-spirited. There's no part of Scripture that the Spirit inspired, which is not meant to be used for our spiritual formation. So really what I want to ask tonight is this. Do we know as leaders how to teach all of Scripture so that it is useful for the formation of the people God has put under our charge? Do we know how to use the Bible so that they can become like Christ? Now, when I talk about biblical literacy, I want to highlight what's one important thing. There's actually four levels of biblical literacy. And sometimes we focus just on the first level. But these four levels, the first one actually begins with knowing the Bible. Sometimes that's where we stop. And I do want to highlight, it's important that people know the Bible. Here's something that's kind of missing, and this is the first thing we notice. We now live in a culture where you can't assume that people grew up hearing stories about the Bible. You know, one thing that defines a culture is that they have the same shared stories. You want to try and define which, is this a culture group? Is that a culture group? Is that a culture group? What are their stories? If they have a set of shared stories, that defines the culture group. But we live in a culture today that has missed out on some of those shared stories. You know, I, I sometimes joke that we now live in a time where less people know the relationship between Jacob and Esau than they do the relationship between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. If I was to go out on the street and ask to tell you, what's the relation with Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader? How many of you would know that people would know the answer to that question? And I say to them, what's the relationship between Jacob and Esau? And their first response might be, Jacob and Esau who? I never met him. Who are you talking about? We're missing out on these shared stories as a culture. I'm not even talking about the church. You know, there have been some funny things that have happened because of this. Uh, one funny thing, although this part wasn't funny, was Princess Di's funeral. Remember Princess Diana? 
When she died, the Prime Minister of England at the time was Tony Blair. Tony Blair's part in the service was he stood up and he simply read from 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no record of wrongs, wrongs, love endures all things, love never fails. He read through that whole thing, never said where it was from, he just stood up and read it. After the funeral, people from all over England wrote into the government asking where they could find that poem and whether or not the Prime Minister had written it himself. They just didn't know. We're losing that culture because we lose those shared stories. A second thing we lose is we also lose the metaphors and image, the shared vocabulary and lexicon of metaphors that come from those shared stories. When Abraham Lincoln stood up and he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand in the Douglas-Lincoln debates, everyone in the audience knew that came from the words of Jesus. He didn't have to explain where that came from or what it was about. You could quote scripture and everyone in the audience is like, oh yeah. When George W. Bush, in his first inaugural address, quoted from the prophet Isaiah, and he didn't give reference, he just said, talked about an angel out of the whirlwind, everyone in the country said, what is he talking about? Did the man just have a stroke on stage? He just starts talking about angels. They had no idea where the reference came from. We lose a sense of shared culture. We lose a sense of the imagery, the lexicon of metaphors that we use to explain other things. But then here's where it gets hard for the church. When we don't have biblical literacy, we also lose an understanding of God's work and God's role in the world. I see a lot of people as a professor who come to North Central University, who even some of them who may have grown up in church, who simply don't know the Bible. And it's not just that they don't know the Bible, they actually don't know that God has always been at work in the world. Because they don't have any stories to explain that. Here's the thing, if you don't know God's word, you're not going to know God's work. And if you don't know God's work, you're not going to be able to discern God's will. And the reason so many people today have a hard time figuring out what God wants, isn't because God's not speaking, it's because they quit reading where he's talking. They don't know his will because they don't know his work because they don't know his word. And I'm finding so many people who simply have a hard time actually talking about what God does and what kind of God is the God who's doing it because they don't have any stories about God. That's that first level of biblical literacy. But that's not enough. The second level isn't just that we know the stories of the Bible. It's that we have to learn how to read the Bible. You know, it's one thing to recognize characters. It's one thing for me to talk about Daniel and the lion's den, and you know what I'm talking about. But the second thing is, but do you know why that should matter to you? Do you know what that story is actually saying to you? The story of Jonah. In fact, let me, let me try this right now. Daniel and the? Okay. Jonah and the? The three Hebrew children. Jack and the... Okay, see, that's not in the Bible. But isn't it funny how many Bible stories we actually talk about as if they were children's stories? So, Jonah and the whale, the three Hebrew children, Daniel and the lion's den. I could have had others to that, but what's crazy is that sometimes as adults, we still treat them like they're children's stories. And we don't actually know how to read them. We don't actually know what this story is telling us about what we should be doing with our lives now. We know the story, but we don't know how to read it. We don't know how to interpret it. It's still at the level of a children's story to us. Not knowing how to read the Bible is still a form of illiteracy, even if you know the story of the Bible. You've got to know how to interpret it. Thirdly, you also have to know how to apply it. You have to know how to apply it. When I know how to read the Bible, I'm better able to apply the Bible to today. When I know what this story is telling me, people are asking questions even about the coronavirus. Is there anything in scripture that can help us navigate that? Things that come up all the time that were unexpected, except you know how to interpret scripture, and now you know which passage to turn to to guide you on this question. When you know how to read it, you become better at applying it 
And then you come down to the last level. And that level is this. Now I know how to live it. Because there's something else the Bible does the more we understand it. It actually replaces our questions with better questions. Because too many times I want to force the Bible into this narrow set of questions that I have that reflect what I think is important about what's going on in the world today. And when I come to understand what God wants and what He's actually doing, I suddenly have a whole new set of questions the Bible's providing answers for. And now I start to see things differently because I'm not looking at the Bible from a 21st century perspective. I'm starting to look at the Bible from an eternity perspective. And I start seeing other people, not from a 21st century perspective, but from an eternity perspective. Because now, the Bible isn't a part of my story that I just turn to whenever I have a question. But now I'm actually a part of the Bible story. And I'm living it out in this way that sets me apart. That's the goal of every Christian. That our knowledge of the Bible will actually turn into personal convictions that guide our lives. When our knowledge of the Bible turns into personal convictions that guide our lives, that's when we can say we have been biblically formed. You know what a conviction is? A conviction is a belief that you hold so strongly that if it were to change, it would actually change who you are as a person. I mean, you know, there are some beliefs you have that if they change, you don't care. You think it's going to rain tomorrow? It doesn't rain tomorrow. Your world is not devastated. But what belief do you hold right now that if it changed, you wouldn't recognize yourself? That's a conviction. Sometimes I say to my students, we don't even sometimes know where our convictions are until we get offended. And then, Have you ever gotten offended by something and you were surprised that that offended you, but you got really offended? Somebody just stepped on one of your convictions. That this is something I hold so deeply that if it was to change, I would be changed as a person. When the stories of the Bible become our personal convictions, then we can say we've been biblically formed. So, how do we as leaders get to the point where we can actually form the biblically literate? We can form the biblically literate. And I want to give you this idea. When we come to Scripture, we don't want to come to Scripture simply for information. We want to come to Scripture for formation. We don't just come to Scripture for information. We come to Scripture for formation. And can I give you some examples of how we can do one rather than the other? How many of you have ever read the Bible just for the sake of reading it? I mean, how many of you ever read the Bible because you felt like you had to today? Like it was a box that you had to check off on your Jesus card for the day, and now I've done this. That's reading the Bible for information. When you read the Bible for formation, you're not coming to it just to read it. You're coming to it to give it the opportunity to change you. You're coming to it to give it the opportunity to change you. Another way we can read it for information is sometimes we read the Bible one verse at a time. Anyone ever done that? You know, it's one of the things that I like and don't like about the U version. Is U version? How many have U version on your phones? It gives you one verse of the Bible a day, and I look at it and I'm like, well, I read the Bible today. And yet the truth is, the Bible wasn't written by chapters, and the Bible wasn't written by verses. You know, the whole chapter idea, dividing the Bible into chapters, was the work of one bishop in England in the 12th century. And the whole point of dividing into chapters is to make it easier to find your place. It's a lot easier to turn to Isaiah 43 than for the guy to say, okay, let's all turn to the middle of Isaiah. And because of that, it was a printer in 16th century Geneva that decided to further divide it into verses. So this whole chapter-verse division is the work of just two people. And we get it wrong at the very beginning. How I many you know Genesis 1, the whole first day of creation, actually goes into the second chapter? We got it wrong in the first chapter and how we divided chapters and verses. Those chapters and verses aren't biblical. They're not Holy Spirit inspired. It was just to make it easier. Here's what a chapter and verse is. It's a page number. Let's all open our Bibles and turn to John 3.16. It tells you where to turn. How many of you know that you don't read any other book just by the page number? You're reading the Harry Potter series? 
Voldemort raised his wand and, oh, page 100, I'll just close the book right now. No, you turn the page! Because you want to get to the end of the story. Reading the Bible for information, we read it one verse at a time. Reading the Bible for formation, we read the Bible one story, one teaching, one idea at a time. Chapters and verses are helpful to find your place. They're not helpful to divide up scripture as this is all it's saying. Does that make sense? Another way, when we read the Bible for information, we're looking for answers to our question. When we read it for formation, we're looking for the answers the Bible has to give, and we learn the questions that matter. Another way we read for information is we judge the message of the Bible in comparison to some higher authority. How many times this happens in class? I'm explaining something about scripture, and a student brings in another authority. And I have to ask the question, why is that more of an authority to you? It's okay to ask the question, how do I compare this to that? But sometimes the question is put is, well, we know this is true. Why is that your authority? When we come to scripture for formation, we're letting the Bible be the final authority. And then finally, when we read it for information, we're trying to master the biblical text as something we control. When we come to it for formation, we're allowing the text to have control over us. Sometimes this is what happens with people who get doctorates, is they do biblical studies because they want to control the text, rather than letting the text control them. That's information. That's not formation. And by the way, I know people with doctorates in the Bible who don't know anything about it. Because they haven't been changed. That's not what matters. If all you know is information. So, this is what we're going for with formation. So, how do we read the Bible? And you know what? I'm going to just go to the next slide and just throw this up here. Uh, it is, I'm going to read this pretty quickly. Uh, this is John Wesley's guidelines to reading the Bible. I just love this. John Wesley wrote a preface to the Old Testament, and in it, in like two paragraphs, he said, here's how you should read the Bible, and it still holds up today. What does he say? One, you got to make time to read the Bible consistently. What he means by that isn't just read it at a certain time of the day, but he means read it as a time set apart. When you come to Scripture, let Scripture be the thing you're doing right now. Don't multitask the Bible. Don't multitask the Bible. Let it be the thing you're doing right now. Secondly, learn to read from both the Old and the New Testament. How many of you know we have a lot of flyover passages, but some of us have a flyover covenant? Where I only want this part of the Bible. In fact, sometimes I say to students, if I ask you to pull out your Bibles and rip out every page you haven't read in the last five years. How big would your Bible be? Okay, well, let's do it a different way. Rip out every page you're not planning to read in the next 10 years. How big would your Bible be? Read all of Scripture. Read in order to learn and to do the will of God. Again, it's this formation idea. Read it in the light of the main teachings of Scripture. Read prayerfully. Because the person who inspired the scripture is actually with us right now. And in prayer, we can read the Bible so that he can teach us what to learn. And then finally, read it with pauses to examine yourself. Now, it is possible to read the Bible and to kind of, you know, I say sometimes when we do surgery on ourselves, we always use an axe, whereas the Holy Spirit always uses a scalpel. So you can over-examine. But the truth is, the Bible is there to form us. When is the last time reading the Bible actually changed your mind? I want you to think about that. When is the last time reading the Bible actually changed your mind? You read it and you said, Huh, i got to do things differently. Read it prayerfully and let it examine you. So, here's how we read. How about how do we teach? You want to hear quickly how to teach the Bible? Yeah. This is my whole application piece right here. And it's simply this. One, have a commitment to the Old Testament. Why do you have a commitment to the Old Testament? 
because you have a commitment to Jesus, and that's what the Old Testament is teaching you about. Have a commitment to the Old Testament, including the ugly parts and including the boring parts. Sometimes what I do with students as well is I say to them, tell me what parts of the Bible we don't need. And while this hasn't happened in North Central, I've been at other colleges where students immediately raise their hand, they're like, I got a part we don't need. So I write it out on the board, and then I write what they've lost by losing that part of the Bible. So we don't need the minor prophets. So I write on the board social justice, and I cross it out. There it goes. What else do we not need? Leviticus. Who needs Leviticus? Okay, environmentalism and holiness. Let's cross it right out. Any part of the Bible that you lose, you lose something significant for the church being the church. And the reason sometimes the church isn't the church is because that's a church that's already cut out that part of their Bible in their experience. Be sure to include everything. Just learn how to read it. The problem isn't the Bible. The problem is lousy teachers. Learn how to read it so you can teach it. I'm going to give you some resources in a second. Have a commitment to the New Testament, including the smallest books, including the scary parts. And of course here I mean the book of Revelation. But including the scary parts. And then commit in some way to teaching the whole story of the Bible. As a leader, be intentional. Because if you're not intentional, what's going to happen is in your teaching, you're going to keep going back to the parts of Scripture you're comfortable with rather than making yourself more comfortable with other parts of Scripture. Be intentional about teaching the whole of Scripture to your community. Uh, there's a variety of ways to do this. You could go through every book of the Bible uh, and an overview in a short time. I did one small group where we did the Bible in 90 days. How much did they take from that? Well, they didn't memorize the whole Scripture. But they did walk away having a sense of what every part of the Bible was about. Uh, you could also go through particular books as part of a yearly plan. You could also go through every book as part of a multi-year plan. Or go through some books and some things as part of a multi-year plan. There's ways you can do this. And I know sometimes our issue is, well, how long am I going to be there? You know, as a pastor, I was at one church for 15 years. I developed a five-year plan of going through Scripture and was able to actually get through the whole of the Bible in that five-year plan. Didn't mean that I didn't stop from time to time. Something came up like Corona, and we got to talk about this. But the more they were invested in Scripture, the more they wanted to get to the rest of the story. Can I give you an illustration of how I did that at my church? And by the way, this is not a recommendation. This is just an illustration. Understand the difference. Here's the illustration. What I did was... I started year one by focusing on Jesus as God in the flesh. That was my theme. And I focused on John, the letters of John in the book of Revelation. And I focused on the great covenants of the Old Testament. Psalms, Isaiah, and Messianic prophecies. And the way I would always do it is this. I'd always begin the year with the story of Jesus. So you go from Christmas to Easter by telling the story. And then from Easter back towards Christmas, I would go through the Old Testament. Always in with Messianic prophecies. So I'm taking them through the story year after year, following different things. Second year, Jesus, Messiah of Israel. And I focus on the New Testament books that highlight his Jewishness. And then I did a whole series on great sins of the Old Testament. You know, it's hard to get through the entire Old Testament, but you can do a series that gets through the whole Old Testament by focusing on one theme. People love great sins of the Old Testament. Something about Christians love coming to church and hearing about how to sin. <laughs> but they loved it. Year three, Jesus, the suffering servant, which is the great theme here of Mark and the letters of Peter. Then I looked at great heroes of the Old Testament. Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, Messianic prophecies. Year four, Jesus, Savior of all. Luke, Acts, Pauline epistles. Then I looked at the difficult passages of the Old Testament. Hold a whole series on the passage of the Old Testament you're afraid to explain to your friends. And we're going to look at each and every one of them. How do we deal with genocide in the Bible? Let's talk about it. And then finally, year five, the rest of the Pauline epistles. Looking at how to interpret the law, minor prophets, and again, messianic prophecies. So that's just an illustration of how you can do this. Now let me give you some resources. We're going to end up here. Uh, these are just resources. What I love to encourage for every leader is build a library. Build a library of books that you can turn to to help you explain things. And I'm just going to highlight some books. Some you may already have, but if not, I'm going to highlight them for you. And I put them in a certain order. 
Uh, understanding scripture and an overview of the Bible's origin, reliability, and meaning. So when people come to you and they just ask questions, how do you know that this is true? You have something to reference as a way of explaining this is why I think the Bible is reliable. Uh, Eugene Peterson, eat this book, one of my favorite writers, phenomenal on how the Bible is to be used in spiritual formation. N.T. Wright, Scripture and the Authority of God. N.T. Wright is the bomb everywhere he goes. If you don't know his name, he is a rock star. The closest thing we have in the world now to C.S. Lewis. N.T. Wright writes about Scripture and how to use it in the church. Phenomenal book. All of these are written at a popular level. Bob Mulholland, Shaped by the Word, The Power of Scripture and Spiritual Formation. And then finally here, John Walton and Brent Sandy, The Lost World of Scripture. What I love about this book is simply this, Walton, professor at Wheaton, is he says the Bible was always written in an oral culture, not in a literate culture. So the way it was written was for people who weren't going to read it, it was for people who were going to hear it. And if we understand the culture it was originally written in, a lot of the Bible makes better sense to us, and he explains that. Now, next slide here. This is readings on biblical formation. How about how to teach the biblical story? Uh, the classic, Gordon Fee, Douglas Stewart, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, multiple editions. Some of you have gone to Christian schools. You already had to read this book as a textbook. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Graham Goldsworthy, written for pastors, How to Preach the Whole Bible as Christian Scripture. Uh, I put in here a cheat, the IVB Dictionary Bible Series. You know, a great thing I recommend for everyone is find a great commentary on every book of the Bible, but you know that is a 20-year project unless you're rich. IVP is a great way to cheat because it is 10 volumes that cover the whole of Scripture, and they will give you a 10-page commentary on every book of the Bible that you can actually use to help you interpret this book. It is a good cheat. Uh, John Stott, The Incomparable Christ. Stott is my favorite for this one thing. He shows how the entire Bible can be broken down on understanding who Jesus is. On understanding who Jesus is, you can break down all of Scripture. And then finally, David Lamb. This is, there's a lot of books like this, but this is a good one. God Behaving Badly. How do you teach the difficult passages of Scripture? David Lamb will give you one way out. Okay, finally, I am so over time. I'm so sorry. Last thing. How many of you would like to measure the biblical literacy of your congregation or your community? Okay, a few of you. Here's a way to do this. I'm going to give you some questions to ask. Sets of questions, and this is just, I'll throw this up here. How do you measure their biblical knowledge? Here's questions you can ask. What's the grand narrative of the Bible? You can simply ask people, what's the Bible about? Do I know the major acts of God in the Bible? Do I know the stories of major figures like Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, and Paul? Could I actually tell you about these particular people? Do I know the parts of the Bible, right? Do I understand why the first books are the first books? Do I understand why the middle books are the middle books? Do I understand why the Old Testament ends with prophecy? I'm not even saying do I know every book of the Bible. Do I just know the major divisions of Scripture and why those books are there? And do I understand cultural metaphors, biblical metaphors in our culture? What about the stories told to children in Christian homes? Here's the thing I'm finding now with a lot of students who are coming. They don't even know the children's versions of the stories. And I realize sometimes as a pastor, here's a series I haven't done yet, I would love to do sometime, children's stories. And actually go into Jonah and the whale, Daniel and the lion's den, teaching people what the story's actually about. But doing it for both Christians and for new believers who never even heard the stories to begin with. That's biblical knowledge. Second set of questions, biblical reading. I'm not going to talk about application and formation. I've kept you long enough. But biblical reading. How do you measure this? These questions. Ask them. What am I reading in the Bible this week? Not today. Just this week. What are you reading in the Bible? When is the last time reading the Bible changed my mind? One thing that that question helps measure is my openness to actually hearing what the Bible says. When is the last time it changed my mind? What parts of the Bible do I understand and or simply read the least? What parts of the Bible do I understand and or read the most? And this is a great one. What parts of the Bible bother me the most? Now, people might not even be able to answer that question because they're like, are there any parts of the Bible that are offensive? Well, you know they're not biblically literate, right? Because there's a lot of parts of the Bible you should be struggling with if you're being formed by this. So what are those parts? And getting them to answer this question 
will also help you know what areas of scripture should I be teaching this community. Because here's where they are, here's where they're not, here's where I need to get them. Okay, I am so out of time. Thank you guys so much. Next, next to, tomorrow morning I'll be back. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about four ways you can build up young adults and four ways you can tear down young adults. So I don't know what you're into, but four ways you can build them up, four ways you can tear them down, and we're going to talk about this uh, tomorrow morning. I'll see you guys then.